Hello and welcome to Ask Us Anything, a very special and exclusive live discussion. I'm your host, Liam McTiernan, and I'm joined today by some of the board and senior leadership team of Table Tennis England to deliberate your questions. Now, before we begin, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the whole membership when I say this is a revolutionary step in improving transparency and engagement. What an amazing opportunity we have to directly engage with some of the board and senior leadership team of Table Tennis England. And before we start, I want to quickly thank those here tonight, Table Tennis England and the Members Advisory Group for making this happen. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we reached out to all the members and encouraged you to send in your questions, no matter how big or small. After receiving a phenomenal volume of engagement, there were some very clear and repetitive questions that we will be asking tonight. I know some had their doubts around whether the really controversial questions would be asked, but I can assure you now that they certainly will be. And of course, don't forget the final section of the show, where the questions being asked will be in the hands of you tonight, as we read out some of your quick fire questions and live in the comments. So let's dive in and introduce each of the panel. Uh, Sarah, should we go with you first? Hi, evening Liam. Um, and thank you everybody. So I'm Sarah Sutcliffe and I'm the Chief Executive of Table Tennis England, um, which basically means I work very closely with the board um, and then help put the operations into place with all the, with all the staff. Excellent. Uh, Sandra? Hello. Uh, thank you Liam and hello to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Sandra Deaton. I'm chair of the association. I'm in my second term of office and um, it's an honour and a privilege to be in the position I am, I am in the term of tennis. Simon? Evening everyone. Evening. Thank you Liam. Um, I'm Simon Mills. I'm the director of sport at Table Tennis England and that means that I look after and responsible for all of this sporting activity. That's from the events, the performance department, the mass and the, and the core teams. Um, and I've been with Table Tennis England since, since 2014, and uh, I'm delighted you know, to be joined by some of the expert panel that, and the expert team that I have in, in the performance department um, tonight. So thank you, for, thank you for hosting us. Brilliant. And Alan? Good evening, Liam. Good evening, everyone. Um, as technical director and technical lead, my role is to basically help our young players uh, find out what they're capable of <clears throat> by making sure they're practicing the right things at the right times. And it's also to help our performance coaches deliver their best work to all of the kids in, in each and every program. Um, I'm at this point having spent 35 plus years uh, being involved in performance programs, including four Olympic Games, um, both as a player and as a coach. And my goal now is to try and pass on as much of that experience as I possibly can to our uh, next generation of players. Brilliant. And last but not least, Matt. Thanks, Liam. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Matt Stanforth. Uh, I'm the programme manager in the performance team at Tilton Tennis England. Um, my role is overseeing the kind of the operational side of, of all of our performance activity, as well as working closely with, with Simon and Al and the other coaches that we have in our team on, on developing the kind of the performance strategy and bringing that to life, really. Um, I've been involved with the youth squads for not, not quite as long as, as Alan with his 35 years, but I've been involved for 20 years. Um, which seems to have gone really, really quickly. Um, and I've had the, the privilege of being able to work with our youth and, and senior squads, both in a, a training capacity, but also in World, European and uh, Commonwealth Championships. So uh, like Sandra, I feel very lucky to have the role I have and uh, great to be here tonight. Brilliant. Um, and then just to open, just an open question for anybody, perhaps you could shed some light on why this live discussion is really important for you. Can I come in with that? Okay. Um, it's really important for me because um, COVID has made it really difficult. Um, normally, particularly in the summertime, this time of year, I'd be incredibly visible to the membership because we'd have league presentations, county presentations, events, much more, um, many more events than we've had, um, been able to have. So I would have the opportunity to see people and have a face-to-face -face discussion with them. I've not had that opportunity. So for me, what's really important is the fact that I want to let everybody know I am here. I'm still trying to do the best I possibly can with this job. I'm going to, I'm going to out, uh, outstand them all, really, because I've had 50 years in the sport, a long time in this sport, and it's, oh, it's been a pleasure to be involved, and still is a pleasure to be involved now. It's my job to govern the board, it's my job to listen and support the um, senior leadership team. 
but most of all it's my job to be there for the membership and I want to let everybody know I am here and I'm still there to do that role. Brilliant and Sarah as the CEO what does this mean for you? I think I mean it's a fantastic opportunity you know we're always trying to um, improve the way do, we do engage with the with the membership you know we've, we've really enhanced things like the website and our, and our emails and I think what lockdown has shown is that um, these live Zoom chats have become yet another way in which uh, it, it's really possible to have, have online debates, to answer questions. We receive a lot of emails in all the time um, from, from the members asking us questions. And you know, we answer those directly. But this is another opportunity to actually answer them in a live forum. So it's a really great opportunity and we're looking forward to it. Brilliant. Um, and I think that let, let's kick off with a, with a very popular question that a lot of members sent in. And that's, what's more important to Table Tennis England, mass participation or performance? Now, if we go to Sandra first to, to give her the first answer. Well, it's quite simple. They're both important. They're both massively important. Mass participation is about the exposure of the sport out there to general Joe public. It's a way of letting people out there know wherever they are, if they're in a park, if they're in a train station, wherever they are, that this table tennis, ping pong, however, you hit a ball over a net and you can play a sport. Um, and performance, and particularly results in performance, and the use of major events and our national championships is a way of showing what level you can achieve and what the pathway is for you within this sport. But the most important part of it is the core in the middle. So it's making sure that from mass to performance, we have that structure, we have that opportunity, we enable anyone who wants to play and wants to get further, wants to be coached, wants to get to, uh, on the talent pathway, has that opportunity to move on with the sport. So mass, performance, and the pathway in between. Both right, okay, that's, yeah. that's the very nature of it. Yeah, excellent. So it's not necessarily just a direct split between participation and performance. There's this whole mm -hmm. part in the middle that sort of links the two as well. Um, excellent. I think, yeah. I think it's a whole, a whole jigsaw, Liam. I think, you know, yeah. if we look at the sport and we look at what we do as national governing body, there's, mm -hmm. there's so many parts of the jigsaw and all of it needs to have its place and it all needs to interconnect to make sure that the whole picture is there. Um, otherwise, we're, we're failing the sport, really, because we're not providing... Um, you know, with, with the mass it provides that sort of visibility and that sort of easy accessible nature that we know and from that whether it's directly or whether it's the next generation of, of players that come from a family you know, it all connects but as Sandra said that core bit in the middle what we call core um, but it means really our clubs and our leagues and, and that absolute sort of you know bedrock of the sport is what the majority of our time and our money and our staff are focused on and the rest all comes around the sides to, to bring the whole picture together. Yeah, brilliant. And I'm really interested to go to performance uh, to get their perspective on this and how that split between mass participation and performance seems, seems to you guys. Uh, so if someone wants to come in from the performance side. Yeah, I guess, thanks Liam. It's, it's fascinating because performance, to be a successful performance player or athlete in any sport, there's a, there's a significant element of selfishness and single-mindedness that's required and, and determination to, to, to succeed. And, and as Sandra sort of said, performance is frequently in the spotlight. It's the one thing that, that ha you know, people talk a lot about. It's the one thing that's covered you know, in, in, uh, on the websites and in the news and so on. But, but as director of sport, I've got a much wider remit. And, and so whilst I've you know, a home and a passion for sort of supporting the future performance and the current performances of our players, uh, um, ultimately, we have a much wider remit. As Sarah said, the core of the sport, the bedrock of the sport is in the clubs and the leagues and the, and the schools and the participation. And, and you know, it's, it's fantastic. And, and our job is to try and connect that together in some way. But ultimately, in performance, if you don't have that single mindedness, then, then, it's, then it's a real struggle. Mm. Yeah, that's a really useful perspective. Um, do, does anyone have any, anything else to add or should I go on to the next, the next question? Well, I, I think I, just to give my take on this, it's probably a predictable answer, really, having spent so long in performance. Of course, they're all important. But for me, just the performance bit of it being so important, especially as it was probably watching my childhood hero, Des Douglas, competing in Birmingham at the World Championships many years ago. That was my inspiration into becoming a, a table tennis player in the in the first case. So 
So for me, predictably, my answer, performance. But of course, they're all important, is the truth. Uh, excellent. Um, I guess the real question is, you know, where's the money spent, mass performance or, or performance? So I guess uh, another question that a lot of people were interested in and sent in was how much money does Table Tennis England get each year and how is it spent? Um, if we go to Sarah first to give us a response, that'd be great. Yeah, th thanks, Liam. I mean, I understand that the issue of trying to understand where our money comes from is, is not that easy to understand. It's, it can be quite complex. But if I break it down, um, you know, a large chunk of our money, about 60%, does come from Sport England. Um, and against that, we have a number of deliverables. So at, at the moment, it's about just under £2 million a year we receive um, this year, and we will get the same sort of money next financial year as well. Uh, and that's really helpful because that goes to absolutely supporting the core of the sport that we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, it funds probably about, well, it, it does fund about three quarters of our staffing costs. Um, it funds the talent pathway. It funds the mass participation work and it funds some of our back office work. So finance department, operations, uh, mem you know, uh, marketing and communications. So it does cover somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of our uh, of our income and our operations and, and without it we absolutely couldn't be doing what we're doing. We get a small amount of money as well from UK Sport. Now that's a Great Britain award um, really targeting uh, participation, qualification and participation at the Olympic Games. The reality at the moment is obviously even though it's a Great Britain award it is, it is effectively ring fenced around uh, our men's team and, and it's got to be really clear it is actually around the men's team. That's not our choice. That is what UK Sport have said they are prepared to fund. Um, and then just like the Sport England money, a lot of it is very ring fenced. And so we get a certain amount of money to be spent in a certain amount of way. And we have deliverable targets against that. The other large chunk of money that we get is so important. Um, and it makes up about, uh, it's about £400,000 a year at the moment, if I look at last year's accounts. Um, and that is the membership income. So that's what, a, what the affiliation fees go towards. And why it is so important is that's, it's unrestricted so we can choose how we spend that money and one of the most important programs we've had to self-fund since 2012 until 2019 has been the performance program so the success over the last four or five years um, you know, 2016 2017 was all self-funded out of membership money and without that we could have been providing the support to those uh, to that program but it goes to do things like uh, fund our development in TT leagues. Yeah. Uh, it, it enhances the membership services department, the marketing and comms department. It helps underwrite things like the national championships. We have to spend, obviously, as a national governing body, we want to put on a, a great national championships, which becomes a product we can then sell for sponsorship. Um, but it's, it's underwritten by membership money, not by Sport England. So I guess on that, so what I've taken from that is that the unrestricted and the unring fence money is really that discretionary spend money that we can, you know, that Save Desk England can spend on a lot of different development uh, topics. And therefore, I think a lot of the, the question, the leading question that the members would ask is, what are Table Tennis England doing about becoming more financially independent with regards to funding and other revenue uh, other than just the sport income? Do we, the sport England income, do we have a funding team? If not, why not? Yeah, it's good. I mean, the unrestricted money is so important because it plugs the gaps, the, the gaps that aren't funded either by Sporting or UK Sport, and it allows us to do things we really want to do. One of the things, one of the programmes that isn't greatly funded by Sport England, ironically, is schools work. Uh, but coming back to your, your actual question, uh, we are working really hard to create products that are marketable. You know, we all want sponsorship. Every sport is out there trying to find more sponsorship money, but the market is really tough. And we, you know, every time we try to go out and talk to a sponsor, we are competing with every other sport. So you've got to have something to sell. You've got to have a product that's really attractive. Mm -hmm. And we're really honest. It's not an easy, it's such a chicken and egg. You know, we, we, by making the national championships an elite event and therefore making it a marketable event that we can put on television, we've been able to get sponsorship. And we can invest that sponsorship back into the event to make it more marketable. You know, to put it on television, we need to have a five camera TV production crew. They don't come cheap. So you can see how it all sort of becomes yeah. a, a virtuous circle. Uh, but we are, we, over the years, we have tried marketing agencies. We've tried in-house um, commercial and marketing people. And again, they come at a cost. 
and it actually takes them quite a lot of money to bring in just to cover their own costs. So we do constantly look at different ways in which we do it. We've managed to treble the amount of sponsorship income that we get in. And you know, the recent signing of the Mark Bates uh, limited sponsorship deal for the, for the national championships for the next five years is massive. You know, it was double the value we had with the PG Mutual and we're so grateful for that, but that's because we've got a product that's more marketable. I think when we ho hosted the Team World Cup in 2018, that was the first time we found that there was a, the doors opened a lot easier because there was a, a really good product that was going to be on television that had access. But even then, what was really interesting is most of the money that came in to support that event was coming out of China. Okay. So the domestic sponsorship market is really tough. But by all means, if anybody out there in the membership either has a company or knows somebody who might be interested in funding, help fund any of our programs, we're happy to package things together, whether it's competition events, whether it's the junior development program, whatever. Our doors are always open and we're really trying to find more and more of that income. So there are, there are for people in table testing are proactively acting as like a funding team, trying to get access to more of this unrestricted funding. That's correct, right? We don't have anybody whose sole job it is to do that anymore. We used to, but yeah. to have a good commercial marketing person costs a lot of money. Yeah. yeah they, they, their salaries are quite large and that means they've got to bring in a lot of money just to even cover their salary. So we don't have anyone at the moment whose job is solely to go out and find money, but it is covered across a number of different parts of the organization. And we've got a great board. We've got some people on the board who've got really good contacts and are providing us with good advice as well. And, and would it, I know the national championships has been a key uh, in the last few years, I guess, to access more discretionary unrestricted funding. And I guess, would it be fair to say that some of the changes, dramatic or not, to the national championships has been in order to get access to more restrict, unrestricted funding. Yeah, can I, can I? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to echo um, Sarah's words about having, you know, to market, we have to have something to sell. Mm. And um, it, it, we looked back at the national championships, I don't know, five, six years ago, and look, you know, how, the way it was, how could you sell this? How could you get somebody interested in sponsorship, sponsoring it with the, the format and the way it was um, processed? over the period of time, during, even during the championships themselves. So to make it an elite event, to look at it and make it an elite event, gave us the opportunity to try and bring in sponsorship, which we did from PG Mutual, mm -hmm. um, and, and came on board. And, and a, a side of that was some membership benefits also. Um, and he stayed with us for three years. Um, we, you know, and we brought about the television production and brought about the streaming. And, and I think that's, that led us on to the sponsorship that we have now. Obviously, blessing Mark is, is as a history in the sport anyway, and always got his heart in the sport. And I think usually fine with a sport like table tennis. That, that's a lot where the sponsorship does come from. People that have got the heart in it, and people that want to try and help us and bring some more independent money. Into it. It. If I could just jump in here, uh, one thing that I just want to ask Simon actually, just see if he can sort of wrap it up in a minute, is like to what extent does performance rely on funding? Uh, clearly, the, the more m money we have, the more we can do, the more opportunities we have to support players and, and funding, you know, Sarah sort of said the elite funding disappeared post London 2012 for, for the GB programs of which the, the, a large component were English. And so there's a, there's a big, big challenge for us to try and fill that gap. You know, funding has changed enormously, you know, over the last 20 years in, in, in elite sport and in the talent domain. But it's really clear more funding is more time to hit balls for young players. No yeah. question. More competition opportunities. And the sport is, you know, you, the ITTF um, are trying to increase the global reach of the, the game. The game costs more, you know, for everybody involved. And so ultimately, very simply, more money, more time to support and hit more balls. No, brilliant. And while, I, while, I, while I've got you at the moment, Simon, um, I'm going to move on to the next question because this is a hugely popular question that was sent in by a lot of people. Uh, and it's, how are we going to get the next Liam, Pitchford, Paul Drinkle or Tintin? And do you genuinely believe we will have this level of player in the next five years or so? So as I said, a lot of the members that emailed in questions, this was a popular topic. So what's your initial response to that? The, the, the simple answer is, I'll answer the second bit um, first. Do I genuinely believe? Absolutely. 
you know, the work that the work that the team are doing, and I'll talk about that in a, in a second, and Al, I'm sure we'll add some more to that. You know, that, that absolutely, we will have that. And we've got players in the, in, the, in the pathway, the likes of Sam and Tom and Charlotte, who are still trying to do that and, and uh, emulate and, and chase and, and catch the, the, the top-ranked players in, in Liam, Paul and Tintin. But, you know, ultimately, we're, we're operating in an environment now, sport is incredibly competitive, and I mean that in terms of uh, both the globalisation of the game, but also in terms of sport and people, young people's time competing for young people's time now is incredibly uh, different to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. And, and so, you know, Great Britain is winning more medals in more sports um, at, at Olympic Games. Rio was the, the most ever get games won in, in, in that sense. So we're competing for participants. We're competing in that, in that world for people to, to engage in the sport. But table tennis England has a long history of punching above its weight for performance history of the of, of the nation in the sport is, is phenomenal and you know continued in recent years with with the likes of the, men, the men's medals uh, the world cups and the world championships um, mm -hmm. and and uh, the quarterfinals of the olympic games and i'm delighted we've got a really great team of staff a really great team of national coaches who are clear about what it takes and will provide the opportunities for players to reach this level so i you know the simple answer is i have no doubt exactly how long it takes that's a fascinating question, and we'll watch this space closely. But yeah. Al, do you want to add some more colour to that and some? Yeah, I, think, some more I mean, so, look, you know, I guess the first part of the question was, you know, how, how are we going to get that level of player in the future? Um, and I guess because you're so close to the performance pathways now, Alan, if you could shed some light on, you know, what's going on and how we're going to develop that level of player, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. I mean, we, we've seen major major changes in our, in our performance programs in the last uh, two or three years. And just to kind of keep everybody up to speed, if you're not already, probably about three years ago, we, we started to look really closely. And it was obvious when you looked at World Table Tennis and saw players like Harimoto and Sato on a world stage, age 14, 15, competing or even winning world senior pro tour events. Uh, amazing, absolutely amazing stuff. And, and also for us, the shift in the standards, even in European competitions, such as Eurominis, you know, we go out there, we take our best young players there. You, we're seeing players, 11 and 12 year olds, incredible, incredible standards, you know, the, and they've been committed to the sport clearly to get to them standards from a very young age and put not just the volume of practice, but the quality of practice in. So we, based on that, and this was led by Matt, well done Matt, um, we started a program back then called the 913, which in short met, meant players roughly aged between 9 to 13. It's now called Aspire. Um, and, that, and, and that was a feeder uh, program going into our England junior squad. Since then, the development has been, has been really quite, quite rapid. And we've developed two more programs that sit below the Aspire that feed into that now called, called the, the Hopes programs. And we've also got... Uh, another program called DICE that sits alongside somewhere between Aspire um, and the England Junior Squad. So significant changes in the last two and a half years or so. Just to give a little bit more context on that, the youngest player that we, we've got in our program is now aged nine. Um, and the average age of the players in all of our pathways is now somewhere between 12 and 13, depending on you know, the start of the program or a year in compared to previously the average age being about 16 so that's already a significant change in the age and the volume of players we're now working with we've got approximately about 80 players working across all of those pathways average age now now is as young as 12 13 hopefully that trend for us will continue over the next next two or three years what we've seen is is actually a much greater commitment to the work. The coaches demand that. If you want to come into our squads, um, actually, you've got to commit to the work that that means every weekend. So we're not going to apologise about that. If you're going to be a good player and you really want to find out how, what you're capable of, of course, it takes a lot of commitment. And also the quality of that work and actually the standards in every single one of our programmes is moving quickly in the right direction. We're not getting carried away. We know we've still got a long, long way to go. But actually, you know, I'm really proud, really proud. And I've been involved in, in our performance table tennis for a long, long time. 
but I, I think we are absolutely going in, you know, in the right direction at the moment. Uh, during lockdown, yeah, it was a little bit, obviously, uh, you know, a difficult time for everybody. Um, but in spite of that, actually, everybody rallied uh, around, and we've seen we've seen some absolutely amazing work during during lockdown. You know, and, and actually been getting clips of up to 200 clips a week from from all of our kids in the programs. You know, wanting coach feedback on a, on a regular basis. And just whilst whilst we're on that, because we were having up to we were doing three sessions a week with each each one of our uh, programs. Uh, I'd like to say a big, big thank you to all of our senior players uh, that contributed, doing Q and A's, doing fitness sessions. They were absolutely brilliant. Volunteered their time, inspired all of the kids and the parents, um, and they want to say thank you to everyone as well. And also a big, a special thanks to Phil Coker who did some amazing work with the, with the physical uh, programs as well. So thank you to everybody that helped us during, during that difficult time. Yeah. Excellent. I think if I... Just, just coming back to answer that question, because yeah, yeah. I realise that, that I'm only, I've only given you a, a, a brief outline of the programs. Absolutely, I'm really, really genuinely optimistic that, that we actually do have, or we certainly will have in, uh, sometime soon, the next Liam, Tintin, Paul in our programmes. And I think what we will see over the next two, three years are young players that are in our programs becoming the top 50 in the world in their age groups. It takes, as Simon said, it takes a lot longer to be players on the world stage being top 20 in the world. But we yeah. will definitely see players in the top 50 in the world. And hopefully, hopefully on a slightly bigger note, some of those players will, will go on to make, become England senior players and also potentially to win medals in an England shirt. That's, that's our hope and I'm absolutely totally optimistic about that, really optimistic. Excellent. I think, and if we, if we just go to Matt just for the last 30 seconds or a minute on this question, and you've been involved with these yeah. programs for a very long time, you know, ever since I was under 15, which is a long time ago. So well, how does this compare, this current program we've got, to the ones you've seen previously? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean as Alan's already sort of said there, the... the the amount of programs, the amount of work that's happening now, you know, we've got from having one squad to, we've now got five squads across the pathway. So, and that's, that's grown over the last two years. So it's a, a significant increase. And I think looking, thinking back to sort of 10 years ago when, you know, when I was working with the old uh, YDS camps and everything, there was, there was that in an England junior squad, but now this is a much more comprehensive. So I think that's what, I think another really important part here is obviously we've got limitations around resource. So, um, we're all, we're seeing the players on a camp by camp basis. So yeah. for me, what's really really important is the work the players do back in their clubs. That's absolutely yeah. vital. And so we've tried to we don't see the limitation resources as a hindrance. We try and find different ways in which to try and direct the work the players need to need to do. So in the last sort of twelve to eighteen months, we've developed something called the England Skills Program, which is a series of kind of tasks and challenges that the players can do. It's broken down into bronze, silver, and gold levels each getting harder with, each, with, with every level. And the purpose of that is really give kind of a framework that players can work on to, when they go home, they have a clear direction of what they need to do, but also getting them to learn other real key bits around how to engage more in deliberate practice, yeah. which not only helps them develop sort of technically and tactically, but what's really important, especially at that performance level, is how, how they deal with things emotionally, mentally, and physically. And then that way we're building the, the players as a whole. So. Yeah, we, we don't look at we we don't we don't we always try and find solutions to try and help things, and I think that the fact that we've got that in place as well, and we've seen fantastic results for what the players are doing so far, and that will continue to develop and evolve as well. Sorry, one last bit uh, that that's probably really important that gets overlooked: that the range of the squads now allows a much more individualised approach, and mm -hmm. sort of this idea of adaptive transitioning, so the players can move between one squad and another at their rate. Yes. And they might move up a little bit, sample it, come back down again, move up, come back down again, move until they're ready. And that the, the beauty of the program, particularly from sort of hopes, aspire, junior yeah. and dice, allows that adaptive transitioning along the way. It's harder yeah. with this when you get into the senior ranks. No, but that, it's really important for the development. No, that's absolutely absolutely thanks for emphasizing. Can that. I? Yeah. Go on then, last, last 10 seconds on this question. Okay, okay, let me, yeah, let me just finish it off and bring it all together. Particularly when we start to look about Liam, because I can tell you something about Liam's pathway as well. 
But the programme that we've got now, the national programme that we've got now for these young ones is absolutely fantastic and it's phenomenal. And it's an opportunity they've never had before. And Liam didn't have that opportunity. So just to bring it all together, what's, and it's brilliant that the, the coaches are passionate about what they're doing and keep in contact with the players outside of the weekends. But what is really important is what Matt has said, is that, and what helped, helped Liam all the way through, was that he had a, a good club, a really strong club that supported him and helped him, and his parents. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. So it's the, whole, it's the whole package. It's That's... parents, it's club, and this unbelievable programme from nine years of age to um, mm -hmm. wh whatever yeah. is now, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, Liam is going to have success. That's absolutely and, fantastic. I think I'm just going to move on just to the next one because we want to get as many questions in as possible. I'm, I'm sorry. Go on then, go on then. Last five. One, 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 sorry, Liam, just one, one last bit. You know, your, your namesake, really, you know, the, the, the progress, you know, Liam's obviously reached a phenomenal level in the world and it's important to probably recognise that we've not had a player at that level for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in, yes. that, in that sense, he, what he's shown, um, you know, he's... He, you know, I, I'm not saying we will necessarily have a future Liam in the ranks at the moment at that level, but we will have players who will yeah. who will perform on the world stage for sure. That's, that's, um, but, uh, that's, that's fantastic. I think I think the understanding is crystal clear there. Um, and, I, and actually, yeah. we've got a lot of comments coming through about money and the junior squad. And hold your horses, for everyone watching, because we will touch on that in a minute. But the the next thing I want to come to is, of course, getting the next Liam Pitcher and Paul Drinkle Tintin is going to be down to getting more players, younger players, into the sport. So what's the plan to get more girls and women into table tennis? And this was, again, a very popular question emailed in. If I can go to Sarah first on this, that'd be fantastic. Hi. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing quite a lot of work, and, and um, I'll pass over to Simon in a minute, because he's mm. had people in his team um, you know, really looking at this. But over the last three years, we've launched a Women and Girls Action Plan. For me, one of the really key sort of light bulb moments um, that came out of some of the insight we did was this understanding that, uh, and it's not a surprise when you think about it, but particularly younger girls respond better to a female coach. Um, and therefore what we thought, well actually you've got to turn this on its head to so how do we make sure we've got more female coaches? So we launched a female coach mm -hmm. bursary to try and bring more female coaches in. So that helps bring more women and girls in. But I had it firsthand. I took my, my young son at the time, eight years old, down to a, a local table tennis club in London where we were living at the time. Um, bless him, the club didn't know who I was. And that, that, so it was my mystery shopper uh, sort of moment. Uh, and there were two girls in this room out of, with about 20 boys. And I sat there and I watched them. And I thought, do you know what? If they come back week after week, that's good on them. Because I, do you know what? If I was them, I'm not sure I would have at their age. So undoubtedly, it's a challenge. Because if I was a young girl, I probably would have walked back out of that club. Mm -hmm. And it's not the club's fault. How do we make the sport more attractive to girls? And I really think a, a big key in that is having more female coaches. Um, but I'm going to pass over to Simon because within yeah. his team, I know that we will work on it. So th thanks, Sarah. And, and you touched on a really important point there. You know, we, we recognise that the, the attracting more girls and women to the sport is, is particularly critical. And the profile and the image of it is, is important. So one of the things that we did quite quickly um, we, when we launched the Women and, Girl, uh, and Girls Action Plan last year was to put um, a female coach on the front of the Level 1 Coach Award. So right at the heart of it is about showing that actually this is possible. We want uh, women and girls to take on these roles. Mm -hmm. We've created a, a female ambassador program. We've got 18 female ambassadors uh, working and volunteering in the sport. And that's just, uh, that's just a brilliant start for us. Yeah. But to give you some comparison, to give you some figures, you know, traditionally our membership base has been around 10% of our members are female. We do know though that the social settings and the work we do in the social settings, so the mass participation programs that you asked about earlier, we know that, they're, that they're a more, they are more attractive and appealing. We mm -hmm. know that the sport is engaging for those, for those women in those settings. So to give you some examples, 54% it, it, of the participants in ping pong parlors are female. That just shows you the difference between the traditional form of the game and the slightly more social form of the game that we know that women are attractive and in, to the sport and enjoy the sport. So our, one of our challenges now is how do we allow that, how do we convey that into a different setting? 
that's more traditional and, and more um, sort of the, the, the local league play. And, and to give you an example of that, our um, work on shorter format leagues has yeah. improved the female participation rate from 8% to 13%. And that may not seem like a lot, but it's a big shift. You know, when you see that the, the age as well of those players in the shorter format leagues is also much, much younger than it mm-hmm. is in the traditional league. So we've just got to keep working and finding new and appealing ways for the for a female audience to participate. And you, work you can confirm that, that that you can confirm that that is very high on your priority list to get the transfer. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. We have we have a women and girls action plan um, that that our, our our core team are really working on and driving. So that's a big part of our BTT program to try and get more female. Um, players in the sport and again to give you an example our retention rate of female members has gone up from 79 to 83 percent over the last few years just to showcase how that how that's improving excellent Uh, i think lastly i just want to because we're we're lucky enough to have sandra with us who is the mother of a previous english national senior champion so i'd really like your perspective on this and some of your insights yeah i mean it's Looking at it from a performance perspective, is it, it's quite difficult. We're going to just go back one step, actually, and that is where I said right from the very beginning when we started off with mass leading up to performance, obviously the most important thing is to get as many girls as possible to play and keep them, try and keep them in the sport. And it's, a, a, it's an international problem. It's a European problem. and in, in Europe, it's a massive problem. If we look at somewhere like Romania, where they have a high successful rate in with their women. They have a mass amount of women that are playing. And, and the success that they have breeds more girls wanting to play in the sport because they get more exposure to, the, to women being successful. Yeah. So we need more at the grassroots level. We need more playing, but we need to be able to keep them and we need to be able to bring them along a performance <laughs> level. Now getting back to what that's like, that's mm-hmm. difficult. It's not an easy scenario. Um, the main reason, I think, is because there isn't, there isn't the money available for the women like there is for the men. There isn't that um, career pathway for them the same. So um, with, with Nicola, you know, there was continually, why am I doing this? What am I going to do at the end of it? Should I be doing my education? Should I be not concentrating on being full time? Where am I going to be able to go? And I, and I think that that's, that that's what it's like for girls. And it's very, very hard. Yeah. So we need to we need to try and, and Europe have identified this. They, they you know they've set up a, an equalities commission to look at it. I think that we need to get more girls playing, moving them from the mass. We know that they're interested in recreational table tennis. Very much interested in recreational table tennis. Making sure that the the local competitions and the local structure and the clubs are female friendly. Yeah. And then try to find some pathways keep them some careers, some way that they can carry on playing the sport and become more successful at performance. Because the more successful they are, the more we'll get girls playing. Yeah, yeah, so it all comes full circle. That's your, I think, I think that's your role on, model. Yeah, no, precisely. I think building on that as well, uh, and this one is a little controversial, but it is called Ask Us Anything, and they, you know, they certainly are providing all the answers. Um, and this is being talked about endlessly in the table tennis community. Do juniors have to pay to be in the national squad and why? I'm going to go to Matt first on this one. Actually, can I, can I, just, can I just jump in just right up front and just say yes? You know, the, the question is, do they have to pay? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, we, we've, um, we recognise this is a very challenging issue and, and, and a very emotive issue for a lot of people. But yes, the simple answer is they, and at the moment, they have to pay to be in the squad. And, and Matt, I'm sure we'll give you, uh, you know, I've jumped in there, sorry, Liam, but um, sorry, Matt, but, you know, funding's, funding is finite. There is only so much money to go around. Mm. And as Sarah said right at the start, you know, the free <laughs> money or money that's, that's at our discretion to spend is, is definitely limited. And there is a real pool on it from across the sport and across the domain. So we have to try and work out how best to share that. And, you know, ultimately that means that we have funding. We've decided to have a bigger programme We've got nearly 80 kids in the program at the moment between sort of nine and 18. And that's a massive number of players. And we're trying to support a bigger program within each of those. So ultimately, you know, we've, we've chosen to do that and people fund that role and the different levels of funding for the different programs. But within that, 
you know, we could choose to go back to funding just a very, very small number, as we've done perhaps in the past, and only fund those three players or two players in each in each gender. Mm. And and ultimately, we've taken a decision that that's probably not in our best interests, and that we need to broaden that. And so we've we've taken that choice. Sorry, Matt, I jumped in. Apologies. Yeah, no, that's okay. You want to provide some clarity on that, and also you know add some add some add something to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I mean, I mean, Simon sort of. Uh, some some up yeah in an ideal world if we had the if we had limitless funding or, or a, a significantly large amount yes the, the problems and everything would be fully funded but we've taken that strategic decision to to actually you know we need to we need to have a broader pathway because we need to get the players started earlier and we need to take them right through um, but what we're trying to do is find kind of different ways to support the players in the pathway from a fin financial point of view so we've managed to secure a number of different funding opportunities. And those range from, from funding opportunities of about £500 all the way up to £5,000 a year per player per year. Um, as Simon sort of said just before, we've now got about 80 players on the pathway. And in, in this current sort of financial year, nearly half of those are receiving some, uh, some form award or being nominated for an award. So to, as a kind of a real quick breakdown we have something called back in the best which is a means test award that's five thousand pounds per year we've got nine players in receipt of that at the moment um we've also got something called sports aid which are awards of between 500 pounds and a thousand pounds we've nominated 10 people for that because of covid some of those awards haven't been made yet uh, but there has been um, a couple that have so far and then um alan mentioned before another program that we've got now running called dice which is a, a diploma in sport in excellence um, and that's a, a, a program designed at, at players age 16 plus. They're in full-time higher education. Um, and the, the, the money that comes from the Department for Education for that actually funds the full training program for that. So from, from the end of this month, we'll actually have 27 players on that program. And that is fully funded from, from the funding that comes from that. Um, and as well as that, with, with that program, if they successfully complete it, they get 64 UCAS points. So if the educational route is really important for them, we've, mm. we've got a very strong relationship with the University of Nottingham as well. That can actually support so, that, that university part as well. So, so let, let, me just replay, let me just replay this back to you and just correct me, sort of correct me if I'm wrong, but um, from my perspective, and I'm sure of all the people watching, we've basically got so yeah, set funding for, for these junior squads and we've chosen to obviously have a broader range and ask for payment as opposed to having a much, much smaller squad which is then fully funded. Is that, is that correct? And then correct, yeah. you are from a not so fortunate uh, background or, or, or have trouble fin financing these programmes, there are and readily available grants that you can apply for and be successful with. Is that correct? I think, I think, I think it's fair to say, sorry, just to jump in there. Yes, in essence, Liam, you're correct. I think a couple of things just to add to that. One is, you know, we don't want finance to be an issue for, for players, but we recognise it's a very challenging issue. So we don't want people to not come to us if they want to be in the squads and they're of the standard to be in the squads. Come forward, knock on the door, because, you know, make the commitment and talk to us about it and we'll find a way to help you. Yeah. You know, that's a simple message. If you, and, you know, to coaches, to clubs, to parents, if your players are at the level to be in the squads, come and knock on the door first. And last, and last, so that's last, last, last question I actually just want to ask on this is, just for clarity, are you a, um, could you represent... England internationally and be selected and not pay to be in the England squad. So that's that's the second that's the second part of that that you ultimately the squads are a choice that people make. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be in our England squad. You can still get selected to all the major events without being anywhere near our England squads if you're at the meet this the performance standards that are specified in the policies. Okay. So you know that's absolutely open. So there is a, there is a dual track route for those yeah. that want to work with us. And those that want to work in another environment, and, and, and if that's I did, absolutely fine. And if I did choose to be in that England squad and pay the sort of money to be in it, what would I get for my money? That, that, that depends on the individual program. Matt, do you want to answer that one? Yeah. So, so as Alan said, we've we've now got a, a lot more uh, training programs happening. So, at the entry level, we have something called Hope's Introductory, which is a uh, a number of single training days and two residential training camps. So that's approximately twelve days. Or Oh, that's, that's, about, that's about 12 days over the course of the year, is what yeah. I was going to say. Um, and then that moves up to the, the hope. Away from mum and dad in a residential camp. 
That then builds to Hawks Advance, which is which is a, 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 um, has a 17 days on it, more residential camps, building through to Aspire, which is 27 days, and then to England Junior School, which is 20 days on core camps. Okay. But with all the programmes, we also look at some additional training opportunities in possibly school holidays, yeah. some competitions and things as well. So, so really, depending on where the players are, depends on what, what the programme will, will offer. Excellent. And, and the final bit I just want yeah. to throw in there, Liam, is that 30 seconds. even right at the top end, although we've, although we've got a grant for, to support from UK Sport to support the, the men's team at the moment, there are still gaps. The players are still contributing towards their own programmes. There, there are always a gap between what the players need to be able to do and what a programme can provide. And that programme, that gap is not just about money, it's about training environments and all sorts of things. And, and so one of the things that we are, um, we're using this as an opportunity, you know, in lower down the pathway to to help players learn about ownership, value, commitment. Yeah. They're all high performance behaviors that we're trying to foster. So, no, so that's, all, all, that's great. The money's a problem. We want think, it, right. we're trying to get yeah. the best way. No, excellent. I think, you know, we've heard, we've heard a lot on this question. It's been excellent. It's been really sort of, clarification has been really good. Uh, so I want to move on. I, I, um, I'd just like to make one point, Liam. Just okay, one point, one point. point. <laughs> you can't say that at yes. the <laughs> no, you can't, yeah. But, I mean, you mentioned earlier on that, you know, obviously the, the parents of a, 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 a successful England player. And parents have always had to contribute towards, always had to contribute towards the training. Um, and if we didn't, in those days, we didn't have the same opportunity at national level to be able yeah. to train at this level. You had to go and find your own training. You had to go and, and travel and, and find, play for your own competitions. So, it, you know, Without the support, without the, the mm -hmm. physical, mental, time support yeah. from parents, and unfortunately, some level of finance, um, you know, it, yeah. it's what's needed for performance players. No, br brilliant. Um, that's, you know, really great answers for that. Um, the next question, there was a lot of these questions sent in, and we'll be addressing what the strategy is to improve the visibility of table tennis. For example, TV and big events. A couple of people emailed in and said, uh, they said they told us about how they attended these big European events, which are really good fun. Why can't we have them here? If I go to Sarah first. I, we want to put on more and more big events, there's no doubt about it. Um, the, the sad truth is we, we come back to the word money again. Um, putting on huge big events costs a lot of money. Uh, unlike uh, a lot of Europe where you still get free um, local authority venues, um, so we don't, we just don't get that. Um, mm -hmm. There are no freely available local authority venues or, or, or venues available of that sort of size. Um, but that said, you know, we have put the national championships on television now for the last five years. First of all, I think it was ITV, then Sky, um, and for the last three years on BBC live streaming. We have the Team World Cup across BBC live streaming. We're constantly in conversations with BBC. So when Liam was going through the very last stages of the, of the Qatar Open, yeah. BBC wanted to take it and we were literally in discussions right up to the very last minute. Unfortunately, the broadband width from the Qatar uh, yeah. venue wasn't strong enough for BBC to be able to take it. So it's one of those things behind the scenes, a lot of conversations are constantly be ha being had, um, not just with television. You know, we know we did some work with Sport Bible um, and live streamed a European qualification match. We're in discussions with a couple of other digital platforms. Um, we're in discussions with a number of other sports for an Olympic media platform. So there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, but none of these are quick fixes and often they're not easy. Uh, but I'm we just, do want to bring... Yeah, yeah and I'm just going to touch on, because although we will do the, spe the, live, the live comments and the live questions last, I just want to pick on a few that I've seen while we've been having a discussion. And um, Ed, Ed Lynn has said... You know, could we have made more out of Will Bailey being on Strictly? Because we're looking for sort of more high-profile table test players. What's, what's your perspective on that? Well, we, we, we put together, for a start, we didn't actually know who's going to be on Strictly Come Dancing until it was publicised. Um, very quickly, the comms team, our comms team, and also you've got to remember we work very closely with our, our colleagues at British Power Table Tennis, and he's part yeah. of their performance programme. We have to respect um, the fact that he sits within their performance program and has a number of commitments to them, and obviously the Paralympics are his, his uh, main goal. Um, but we worked very closely with them immediately, it was announced, to put together an agreed strategy about 
how we were going to promote it, how we were going to back it. We had a back Bailey campaign going. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we were speaking to Will about what he could do to help support some of our disability programs afterward and just generally help the visibility. So, yeah, um, I actually don't think we could have done a lot more because actually, yeah, you know, that's much you can do with any one part of the sport. Um, yeah. What we do do is we track engagement. So we knew how much our membership were engaging with the information we were putting out about Will. We could see when it was peaking, we could see when it was falling on deaf ears. So you mm. tweak your strategy to make sure that you're communicating at the right place and the right time to the right people. So yeah. I think the message there is a lot goes on behind the scenes that people might not understand that we're doing to constantly look at how we promote and engage and you know the visibility of the sport has increased a lot in the last five years. You know, I think People don't realise that. Yeah, you know, when you're out talking to people, people say, "Oh, ping pong parlours. Is that something you do? Oh, all those outdoor tables popping up in shopping centres. Is that something? Or yeah, stations. Is that something you do? Oh, I saw table tennis on, you know, BBC yeah. Live. Is that something you do? It's all part of a bigger picture. And yeah. yeah, we're constantly chipping away and trying to find the next way to continue to promote the sport because we know that is a fundamental role for us as the governing body. Um, to do and um, you know we work with the, IT, the ITTF as well on their strategy so yeah. we're trying to get um, you know we have conversations with BBC for example about taking the world championships or about taking the European championships again there are often logistical reasons why it doesn't happen BBC often can't take couldn't take the world championships they wanted to because the branding was too heavy so the ITTF branding their commercial branding was too heavy for the BBC to be able to take it so there are often hurdles, but I guess the message is we're trying, we're trying hard, and we're, we're trying multiple angles. And I guess yeah, one, one of the one one of the sorry Liam to interrupt one of I mean obviously one of the strategies and, and, and priorities as far as the board's concerned of is major events is to bring major events into England, um, and um, obviously now there's World Table Tennis uh, which has been formed, which is um, up up lifting the events or, or making them much more uh, fan-based and fan-friendly and and there's lots more criteria that we have to fit into but we're on that we're in that table and we're talking to them we're knocking on that door to try and get world table tennis events back into england um, they came to us with regard to 2026 world championships because it's a centenary of the ittf uh, and they came and they wanted to bring it back into London and we've had conversations, we're in the mix of conversations with the ITTF on how, how we can bring that here, now we can have that major event strategy and pathway yeah. leading into uh, 2026. But again, as Sarah says, Sarah says, even with major events, it's about money. And yeah. we, have to, we have to make sure that we, they're underwritten and that, that there is no financial, major financial liability to us. But that's one way that we can expose, no, we found that with the World Team Cup, one definitely. way that we can expose the sport. I think if, yeah, if we could get you know, a couple of those big events here in the next few years, that'd be a huge step. But, and the last thing I want to touch on this question is that I know that we touched on the national championships earlier and how you know, we've changed them, Table Tennis England changed some things to, to get more sponsorship. Um, a, a question we had earlier in the comments by Cliff Carter was, how can we attract more spectators? Because some would say that the Nationals may have, you know, been attracted less spectators in the last few years. So um, how can we do, how can we attract more spectators? Well, I think that the bottom line is it hasn't. When I first joined, the number of spectators at the National Championships, but I can tell you for a fact, we sold 26 tickets my first year um, for the National Championships. So the spectators were friends and family who were all coming for free. Uh, now we sell anywhere between uh, about six, seven hundred, and up to almost a thousand tickets for the national championships. There, pounds worth of funding to help underwrite the national championships. Um, again, it's we work closely. So Nottingham has had the national championships for the last two or three years. We work closely with the local authority there, the local council, to publicise it nationally, locally, because you know we we do get people coming from around the country to to come and see it. Um, yeah. It's, we do tend to find it is table tennis people that come to the national championships. It's a struggle to get the non-membership people. So we analyse where the ticket sales have come from, and yeah. it is nearly all members. Um, but it's no, excellent. No, no, precisely. Um, I, we're we are close to running out of time, so I just really want to squeeze in a few more questions on this next one. Uh, I'm going to ask it, but I want sort of a quick, sort of two-minute answer. Um, so we've had a, we had an email from some of the members that said. 
it's rare to see coaches of the performance team at national events. Why is that? I want to go to Matt for that one or two minute answer. Yeah, I mean, in answer to, to that very quickly, is we do go to the national events. Um, the, the, the all or if not the majority of the performance team will be at every age group national championships and national cup. Um, as we said before, we've got way more programs happening now than we, we ever have done before. And that means that we've got training activity pretty much every weekend of the year, which for me, it's, it's fantastic. We've got so much going on, but and that doesn't even take into account any additional camps to do or international competition. Um, at times, we, we, we sometimes attended Junior British League or Four Stars or the National Schools Championships, for example, um, if it's been possible to do so. But the reality is we can't be in two places at once. Uh, we placed our priority on, on that, those training programmes and making yeah. them uh, work for the players to help them find out what they're capable of. No, excellent. And I think, Simon, I know you're itching to say something. So I'm going to come to you for this next question, which is fairly close to a lot of people at the moment. And that's why are performance roles never advertised? It's been at least four to five years since an actual coaching vacancy has been advertised. What do you have to say to that? Thank, thank, thanks, Liam. I am always itching to say something as you, as you <laughs> write. I think, I think very simply, permanent employed roles are advertised. And the last time we had any permanent employed roles was in 2016. And there were four of them at that point and they were advertised. We do use our network to fill ad hoc or extra support roles that have arisen from time to time. And as Matt and I've said, and Alan said, the programmes have grown enormously in the last couple of years. And we filled those, you know, in, in, that, in that way. But Alan talked quite openly about, in, in an article that went on our website about two weeks ago, now 10 days ago, about an open door policy. We, we have an open door policy. We want coaches to put their hand up. We want people to join us on, on the journey. In fact, actually more than that, we need people to join us on the journey. Matt talked about it very passionately in, 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 his, uh, in his conversation about the programme and the, the critical element that home coaches play in supporting athletes on their, on their journey with us in the squads. So it's absolutely critical ultimately that they're with us and we want them with us on that journey so for all those coaches out there please get in touch get in touch with Alan um, and and talk to the other the other couple of bits on that we will commit to trying to promote opportunities as time um, as time allows really in that sense but a final thought really for me um, it's it's normal in performance sport and you know give the example of football managers they bring a team together to work with them that they can work closely with and that's normal in performance sport, and, and we're not doing anything different to that. But yeah. we will continue to advertise permanently employed roles. And, and, and Matt and Alan, I know that you know you both had experience working with the national squads before coming permanent employees. So, you know, what's your take on that and experience? Um, just, just I guess, just adding to what Simon said because that article that we put out there, we're not very good sometimes at, at, at probably letting people know what is available. Genuinely, our door is always open to coaches and any coach that's curious about what we're doing in, our, in the performance programs. In fact, I've, we've already had quite a considerable number of coaches contact Matt and myself. At the moment, it's difficult to, to get them in because of the COVID situation. But we absolutely want to hear from coaches that are genuinely interested about the work that we're doing because actually it's going to take all of us pushing the kids in the same direction mm. if we're going to get them Absolutely. to reach them. And I don't feel that we've done that well enough yet. So we genuinely want coaches that want to be on board with us to come and come and talk to us. Come and, and if they've got any questions, we will happily answer any of them in that environment. Excellent. And I guess, you know, I guess um, a, a big topic about this is transparency and communication. That's you know huge and the and the overarching topic on this question. So, Sarah, do you think we could do more on? Do you think Table Desk England could do more on transparency um, and communication? I think um, I think communication is always one of those things where people will say you don't communicate enough, and one person's you know too much communication is another person's too little. Um, we want to do better, you know. I'm not going to sit here and say we've got it right because, you know, we obviously haven't all the time and, and you know, I guess I can't expect that we ever will get it right all the time. Um, yeah, transparency, again, you know, we want to put as much out on the website as, as we can. 
unfortunately, the way our website is currently structured is stuff moves off the front page quite quickly and people might not realize that we've put stuff up there and it's not that easy to search for. Uh, we are investing in a whole new website and hopefully we'll find better ways of making sure that information is available. Um, as I say, we've got a, a general help at Table Tennis England email address and we track every question we get and we do make sure we respond. Um, we've got a ticketing system that we can see that we've responded to emails. They don't get lost in the system anymore like they might have done two or three years ago. So I guess my pledge is, yeah, we want to be transparent and we want to communicate in the right way to the right people and the right medium. Um, we're trying our best. I, you know, we're obviously not getting it right. Yeah, I don't think anyone ever does get communication bang on, um, but we're, we're trying and you know, really open to ideas and suggestions about what we should do. You know, like tonight, this is a great example of you know, how we're really willing to try and do things differently. And Liam, just on that note, you know, with lockdown has thrown up a massive opportunity. You know, yeah, Sarah yeah. talked about sort of using Zoom and things, but you know, Ali has run many, many coach webinars for for the for the coaches in in, in the sport, and will yeah. continue to do so. You know, we have had, you know, we've used this platform in 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 lots of ways to support <laughs> the the, um, the developmental pathway, but also the clubs returning to table tennis. Greg's run. And his team have run many, many webinars for, for, for clubs and for leagues coming back to the sport after the COVID scenario. So we, we are trying to reach different people in different ways and, and, and acknowledge, you know, speaking for the performance program, as Alan said very clearly, we know we haven't got it right. You know, we're not trying to, we're, we're trying to find better ways to communicate. Hands up. We don't always get everything right. Sometimes it's very much hands on, get the work done, you know, work with the squads and the teams, yeah. but we want to continue to develop. I think, you know, it is, it is great that you've recognised that and that it's on your priority list to, you know, try and improve that as the best you can over the next foreseeable future. Um, and I think, you know, what a great discussion it's been so far. And I'd like to now call out some of the questions we've received live during the show for the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, so the first one is Simon Morgan has, uh, has, has sent in a question, which is why can't tournaments that, that can be conducted in 100% safe and socially distanced venues commence play. If I go to Sarah on that, um, why, can't they, why can't they commence play? Uh, I'm afraid the, sh the short answer is we have to comply with government guidance. And at the moment, government guidance does, doesn't allow for competitions to take place um, outside of bubbles of six. What we're doing is trying to see whether we can get dispensation to extend that um, up to say bubbles of 12 or 15. We're in those discussions with Sport England and DCMS now. And what we're doing is we're tracking as ready, as soon as government guidance changes, we will be the first people to be letting you know that we can get competitions up and running again. We want to get competition going as soon as possible, but we've got to wait for government guidance, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, brilliant. Um, and another one, uh, there's, been, there's, been, so there's been a lot of questions on grassroots. Um, and I guess this, this is a chance to shine some light on that. Um, what uh, we, we've had a lot about performance, but not about grassroots necessarily. Should we be doing more to support clubs? Who'd like to chip in on that one? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then others by all means jump in. Yes, I mean, we want to support the clubs to continue to grow and develop. And, and um, Greg's team with, with Claire, you know, looking after the clubs and, and leagues, we are trying to do more. We've got a BTT programme running, trying to support clubs to to work on initiatives that that support their development and, and ours tt kids as an example is a big program that we launched last year um, to get more kids into the sport we had a fantastic uptake uptake from the from from clubs um, and again 33 percent of the tt kids participants are female by the way so again connecting that more with the, with the female audience um, and so we are doing an awful lot we are trying to do more there is you know, as, as we've talked about many times, limitations on what we can do, um, but we are certainly trying to do more with our, with our club programmes, you know, back, back and chat sessions, you know, back, back to TT. There are a range of things that are going on to try and support clubs to attract participants. We have a, a club spark platform for clubs to support their administration and their um, and they, the, the way that they manage their, their communication with their members and so that members can sign up within that platform um, and bookings and so on. So there are a range of things that we are doing to try and help our, our, our clubs do more. I think one of the challenges of this funding cycle is that Sport England have stopped giving governing bodies um, facility grants to be able to apply within their sport. 
So yeah. if I go back to the last four year funding cycle, if we actually had a million pounds of facility grants that we could be distributing within the sport. Sport England have taken that back centrally. So no governing bodies have facility grants to provide anymore, um, which has hindered our ability to be able to directly influence those clubs that need that little bit of extra grant money. What we can do is support any club in making a direct application to Sport England or their local authority or their CSP um, for funding. But uh, that has impacted us and it's impacted all the governing bodies actually in the way they can support their own, um, their own club network. And on, on that, we, our, our staff also just in lockdown, Liam, were, yeah. were hands on helping clubs apply to Sport England in, for the, the club grants that were made available to support the, the lockdown process. So, you know, there were quite a number of table tennis clubs. I haven't got the exact number off the top of my head, but quite a number of table tennis clubs, you know, at least 30 table tennis clubs that benefited financially, uh, uh, but were supported through that process by our staff. I do, you know, we can't get away from the fact that clubs are a vital part of the core of the sport. And yes, we've got to support them in every possible way that we can. And I think we've got some programmes that are supporting them. But it's about clubs also wanting to work with us. It's about people. You know, the most important thing is having the people within the club environment that are happy to work with the governing body to introduce. We, we can put a bat and chat or tea and toast or whatever the concept is, we can put that out there. But then the people in the clubs have got to want to engage in that with that and keep right. the membership coming through. That's a really, yeah, that's a really good point because if I'm a club and I wanted to seek, you know, having some maybe problems with membership or wanting to attract more players and I want to seek your expert guidance from the governing body, how easy it is, is it for me as a club to approach someone in the governing body and give me that sort of advice or link me up with someone else at another club that's done it. How, how easy is that? So the first thing, if you don't know you personally or your club doesn't know anyone personally in Table Tennis England, um, as Sarah said, help at tabletennisengland.co.uk. Get in touch. We'll, we'll get, um, get your email passed on to the, the, the coach team um, and we'll, someone will be in touch. So, or the club team rather, and someone will be in touch. So that's, that would be my okay. suggestion. Yeah. And I know this, this, this continual, this continual um, publicity and opportunities that you see on the website all the time about the different programmes that we have and how if, you're in, if the clubs are interested in yeah. uh, engaging in the different uh, programmes, they can get in touch with the development department. Um, it, Claire, who's in charge of um, a clubs officer, is, is there talking to clubs. I've read a report ready for the board meetings. I think she's, she's had something like 160 conversations in the last... Yeah. few weeks with different clubs um mag also had some conversations recently with clubs i think it i think it's about about this uh, two-way communication you know the clubs getting in touch with the governing body and the governing body getting in touch with the clubs but the programs are there but you still uh, need people in those clubs to drive those programs and i guess uh you know on, on that note as a member of the members advisory group as well we've won we've ran many discussions with clubs and we would encourage anyone watching from that hasn't been involved to really get in contact with any of us to also be involved with that. Um, we've had a lot, lot lastly, um, we've had some questions that is to do with this topic that said, what's being done to turn ping players into club players? I, I think ping parlours is a start. <laughs> so there's, one way. There's, there's, a, there's a few things there, uh, Liam. The, the first is, um, where, where we can, we are trying to connect clubs with the ping opportunities, particularly the ping parlour opportunities. The ping opportunities are very, very transient and people come along, play for a little while and yeah, move on. Okay. Ping pong parlours provide a greater opportunity. On, on a couple of notes we've had um, in the North East, and I won't uh, specify the clubs, but we've had a couple of clubs that have not been able to reopen, but their parlours have reopened. So the clubs actually have been able to take their sessions right. into ping pong parlours. Yeah. So we are trying as much as possible to connect the county and the, and the club or the local clubs with those opportunities in parlours. Um, it's and we've got a range of clubs supplying and many volunteers to support those activities in in their ping pong parlour program. 
um, or the, the local parlor rather. So we've got activators from different clubs providing sessions. And, yeah. and I would suggest that if there's a club that doesn't know there's a parlor or finds out there's a parlor next door that we haven't yet been in touch with, mm -hmm. please talk to us because we will find a way to engage you um, with that, that parlor. The, I guess one of the other things is recognizing the difference and I talked about that earlier in the women and girls thing, that the, the social setting in parlors is quite a different setting yeah. to, the, to many, many club environments. Yeah. And I think recognizing that participants want different experiences and mm. different environments to, to consume the sport in. So I would just encourage clubs to look at the participants that enjoy the parlor experience particularly mm -hmm. and okay. how they might support them to their Club. I'm, I'm going to have to jump in there because we're, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, but what an amazing and insightful discussion with a lot of ground and taboos covered. Uh, in this last minute, does anyone have any final thoughts? Sarah? Think, yeah, do you know what? I just wanted to say, actually, th thank you to everyone who's on this. Thank you to Lee and thank you to all the questions that have come in. I'm, I'm looking forward to actually going back through them. Um, but I do actually want to say a big thank you to the members. We've talked about how important our, our unrestricted income is, and that is membership money. Um, COVID has obviously thrown up a major challenge for all of us. And, you know, as of now, we've got just under 50% of our membership have renewed. You know, I really do urge anyone out there who hasn't renewed yet um, to really think about it, because that money is helping underpin some of the work we're doing. Um, but a big thank you to everybody, because I think this has been great. Um, we'll probably do it again in the future at some time. Um, so thank you, yeah. everyone. I, I, I would like to, I'd like to, uh, echo, uh, I'd like to echo Sarah's thanks, Liam, um, to everybody. Um, I, I'm just like to say, I, I hope it won't be long because before we can be out there and yeah. see our friends and colleagues and the table and his family, because for me, you know, it, it's the most important thing, the Chamber Tennis family, the people that are involved in it, our members, our volunteers, our club supports, our, you know, they're, the, they're what it's all about. They're what the sport's all about. Uh, uh, Sarah, and I also like to thank Dean. Sorry, let yeah. me just finish. Sorry, yeah, 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 Dean, sure. Dean Navarro as well. I'd like to thank Dean who's, who's been really helpful. But particularly, obviously, thanks to Sarah and Simon and yourself, but particularly Alan and Matt, because they've been working all weekend. All weekend they've yeah, been yeah, running, yeah. running a hopes program, yeah. and, and they really wanted to go home and have a nice meal and a cup of tea, <laughs> or a gin and tonic or whatever. <laughs> and here they, here they are. The world. <laughs> so, and, uh, um, thank you to everybody yeah. and and the senior leadership team and the board. I mean, you know, it's a great group of people to work with. But especially thanks to Matt and and Alan because you can you can now go and have your pint or whatever it is you're going to do. I think. <laughs> and sorry, and, I, just just one thing for Sarah. Um, I know a lot of people have sent in a lot of emails with different questions. Um, do you have anything to say on whether they'll be answered or not? Yeah, absolutely, Liam. And I, and I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Um, there was obviously going to be no way we could cover everything today. And some of the questions we also received were quite individual in their nature. Everybody who emailed in a question to the Ask Us Anything email address will get a direct response. If we haven't managed to cover it tonight, we will send them a, a written response in the, in the coming two or three weeks. Brilliant. Thank you, Liam. You've been brilliant. Thank you. No, no problem at all. Uh, excellent. I hope everyone watching enjoyed that as much as me and has a lot more clarity over what Table Tennis England are doing. Uh, of course, not everyone will be 100% satisfied with everything that was discussed. However, putting personal views aside and given that this... <laughs> I'm sure I speak on behalf of the whole of Table Tennis England membership when I say that we truly value the whole panel's choice to come on this show and talk openly and honestly. Uh, they certainly didn't have to do it and it would have been really, really easy to just say no. So we're all much appreciative and let me assure everyone watching, this is just the beginning of a new collaborative and transparent era for English table tennis. I very much hope we all get to do this again. That's all from me, Liam and see you next time. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.